All right, we're trying something a little bit new today, what we're calling a post-mortem. Uh, now, since this is our first one, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I and my family usually do after movies or after playing a good video game or watching a good TV show that we enjoyed. Um, we talk about it. We're an analytical family. We like to go over even the things that we loved a lot and talk about what worked for us, what didn't work for us. Uh, and so that's what I'm hoping to do with these kinds of post-mortems, uh, which the first of which is going to be Mary Poppins Returns, which is a very enjoyable movie that I got to see with my family this afternoon as part of our Christmas break. Uh, as those of you may know, uh, it is the sequel, as hinted at by the returns in the title, to the, uh, I believe it's 1964 uh, movie, famous movie with Julie Andrews as Mary Poppins. Um called Mary Poppins and had Dick Van Dyke in it, had a number of famous songs uh, from the, the old the old Hollywood days of the 1960s and the big musicals of the era, uh, including Spoonful of Sugar and Super, uh, Super Califragilistic Expialidocious and Let's Go Fly Kite and things of that nature. And this is a film that looks back on that time, really, 50 years later, uh, and really kind of copies what made the original Mary Poppins so great in a way that I think is going to work for a lot of people that especially enjoyed that original film, uh, but maybe won't work for anybody looking for something even a little bit different uh, from the original plot line of that movie. Uh, so with that all being said, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this film. Um, as I said, it is uh, an enjoyable one. It's a lot of fun. It has a lot of uh, good music, uh, perhaps music that isn't quite as good as the original, but as I said, the original movie had some of the most famous songs uh, in the Disney songbook. Uh, and so it's it's a little bit unfair to expect that greatness from a sequel, although it would have been nice to enjoy the songs in the movie just a little bit more because, as we'll talk about in just a few minutes, uh, that's really what the movie hung its hat on. Uh, like the first movie, the plot of Mary Poppins Returns is very simple. Uh, it talks a, a lot about uh, family. Uh, it talks a lot about dealing with loss. It talks a little bit about uh, kind of capitalism and banking. Uh, this movie takes place at the height of the Great Depression, uh, which uh, is called the, the Great Slump, I believe, uh, in the film, uh, which I'm taking to be a, a British description of the same time period. Uh, but in essence, it's a time of economic loss and turmoil. And so the movie starts in that, uh, in that framework and moves on from there. Uh, and uh, there are going to be maybe some light spoilers in here. I don't think Mary Poppins Returns is a plot-driven movie. Um, so if you are worried about the plot, if you're going to see it over Christmas break or, or later on, you might want to turn this video off and come back to it later. Uh, but for the most part, there isn't a lot of plot to ruin. The plot is very simple, much like the original. Uh, and so uh, that, that's, that's, we're going to talk about a few things in relation to the plot, uh, but not too many. Um, that all being said... I think what the plot does do pretty well is it does um, talk about things that aren't in Disney movies very often, which is uh, although Disney movies often feature a missing mother or missing father character and, and maybe some sense of loss in the distant past, Mary Poppins Returns is very much about present day loss. Uh, the original Mary Poppins boy child uh, is now a, a widower, uh, having lost his wife uh, within a year of, of the film taking place. And that grief is clearly sitting on him and the rest of the house. And that's where the movie begins. Uh, and that's where you see the kids having had to grow up for themselves. They are very adult at the outset. And if you were to describe an arc for them, uh, it would be that they uh, are, are have to learn to find their imagination again after a very rough year. Uh, with essentially the same kind of plot line as the original movie and a, and a similar kind of plot line for their father where he maybe doesn't need to find his imagination again, although there is a little bit of that, but he has to get over the loss of his wife, realize what's right in front of him. Very typical Disney plot points and, and very much not unexpected for a movie of this type, but still well done. Um, and certainly one of the things that is really going for the movie, as you can see here from, from some of the clips, some of the trailers that uh, the Walt Disney Company has on their website, it is beautifully shot. It is, to my eye, significantly prettier and more enjoyable to view than the original movie, although that's really a function of time. Uh, and certainly Mary Poppins was a lot of fun and had some really cool shots uh, back in the 1960s. Uh, but this movie has some really tremendous choreography, some wonderful dance numbers, some really good lighting. It just is enjoyable to view. It's You, you sit there in the movie theater and you like what you're looking at, with the standout there being uh, the cartoon number, which matches up with... 
Uh, they're jumping into the chalk from the old 1960s movie. In this movie, they travel to a similar kind of fantasy location, and the animation is absolutely 1960s Robin Hood era Disney stuff. Uh, and it was so good for me to see that kind of 2D animation really take off, really uh, be enjoyed by an entirely new audience. Uh, all these kinds of anthropomorphic animals, all these kinds of really bright colors uh, that uh, was just a lot of fun. And then you tie that up with some really cool costume design and some cool kind of little visual effects that really reminded me, honestly, of Disneyland or Walt Disney World and, and Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in terms of the kind of neon pastel coloration that they take on and fit the real world characters in that cartoon environment. That, to me, was the standout of the film and, and very, very enjoyable. Uh, that being said, as we talked about right at the start of this postmortem, the movie is really kind of a uh, Broadway review. Uh, it is a thin, thin plot line on which to hang I don't know, a dozen uh, musical numbers, uh, some of which are, are good, uh, only a few of which are maybe a little bit dull, none of which are outright bad. Uh, but unfortunately, when you have that kind of structure in a movie, and I sat there enjoying this film, having a good time, but when you have that kind of structure in a movie and you have kind of this seminal classic that you are the sequel to, um, it really does start to feel perhaps a little bit hollow while you're watching this film. You're sitting there thinking, well, that's kind of the number that's step in time. That's kind of the number that's like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. That's kind of the one that's like spoonful of sugar. And you go through the movie like that. Seems to be like that's the way the movie was structured. That's the way the movie was made from the producers on down. And while that's a good approach to make sure that you stay thematically consistent with your prequel, with the original film, it does create this constant consp comparison that you're going through and saying, well, how do I feel about this song, which is clearly an analog to this older song, and which do I think is better? So at least for me, and maybe I'm just a competitive guy and I'm watching movies in this fashion, and maybe this won't happen to you while you're sitting in the theater or watching this on home video, but at least for me, I look at these songs and go, hmm, I think the original was better. Hmm, I think the original was better. Hmm, I think the original was better. And unfortunately, sitting here, I can't think of any specific musical number or even dance number necessarily that was more impressive in this latest iteration than it was in the 1964 original. So you've got this kind of situation where it's an enjoyable movie. It's a good time. It's certainly a film that is not... Uh, not the standard for what we see. Because it is so closely aligned to the 1960s movie, it really does feel like it's uh, a movie out of time. Uh, and for me personally, I like that. Uh, if you've read any of my entries on Star Wars or anything related to movies or video games, you'd see one of the themes that goes through my uh, writings is that I feel that we're in a cultural situation where earnestness is really looked down upon, that people like to be ironic or meta-contextual in order to avoid being laughed at. And Mary Poppins Returns is very, very, very earnest. It has really no irony in it at all. All these musical numbers are done in full bombast and fully uh, in the moment for whatever it is they're singing about. And I like that. Uh, it's a very old school kind of Disney approach. Uh, you know, the, the beleaguered father and his work environment, the the... I was going to say evil, but kind of at very least cold-hearted bankers dealing with, you know, the, the kind of classic story of the family's going to lose their farm and the bank's coming after it or the kind of uh, constant uh, Western plot line. And uh, that earnestness really, really works for me. I will say, though, that that might not work for everybody. Um, certainly some of the other movies I've watched and I've talked to people on Twitter or on social media about that I've enjoyed for their earnestness of late, such as Mortal Engines, are really kind of uh, dinged on their reviews or on people feel on how few people feel about them for that earnestness. I think some people would prefer a more uh, ironic touch, a more comedic touch when you are dealing with something so inherently silly as a, a flying nanny that comes down on an umbrella to solve all of your psychological problems. Uh, and so I, I, I like it. That might not work for some. Uh, it is certainly uh, jumped into with both feet uh, in this film. Uh, and so I think that's that's an enjoyable uh, an enjoyable part of the the film on the whole. So what you've got then is you've got a, a, a movie that's filmed well, has has good acting performances. I think Emily Blunt's Mary Poppins uh, is is a very difficult role to to take on. Uh, much like uh, earlier this year in Solo, uh, where you had a new actor try to take on the the character of Han Solo. This is a, a 
iconic character that has only been played in the movies by one actress before. And so taking this on could have easily gone very wrong. And I, I don't think that Emily Blunt is trying to be Julie Andrews in any respect. I think this Mary Poppins is her own. And it winds up feeling very much like almost a, a James Bond or Doctor Who type transition where, yes, this is the same type of character. It's a magical nanny. But Emily Blunt's Mary Poppins is different than Julie Andrews' Mary Poppins. And I think that's a tremendous decision. I think that works very well. Unlike in the musical numbers that we talked about early, you're not constantly comparing Emily Blunt's performance to Julie Andrews, or at least I wasn't. And I think that is is very, very good. So the acting all around is pretty good. Lin-Manuel Miranda is a genius, certainly as a, as a musical composer. He's an adequate actor. He isn't really given a lot to do in the movie in terms of character arcs or plot. Um, but he's perfectly fine. Um, I think uh, the the male lead, the, the, the father that needs to find himself uh, is tremendous. Uh, he's long been a favorite of mine. His name is uh, Ben Wishaw, and he is uh, one of the main characters in the very underrated Cloud Atlas movie that I enjoy from time to time. Uh, and you may have seen him in some other roles as well. But he he's done very well in this movie uh, and has by far the most kind of emotional heavy lifting to do. He's really the only one with a significant emotional plot arc, uh, and he does well with it. Uh, so there's very little to complain about at kind of a baseline level in this film. It's got good acting. It's got good visuals. It's got good music. Um, but it isn't Mary Poppins. It isn't a classic like that 1960s movie was. So you find yourself sitting there saying, oh, I had a good time. That's a good movie. I'm glad it exists. Um, I, it doesn't match up to the, the prequel that originated it. And to me, I think that's okay. I think it's okay to have a movie that is a solid four stars or a solid eight out of 10 and maybe doesn't rise to that level a 10 out of 10. It's certainly not a disappointment. You're going to see some cool stuff. Don't go into the film expecting expecting a very detailed plot line uh, or anything that's really going to surprise you. It's very much an old school uh, 1960s type era Disney movie, uh, but it is an enjoyable one. Uh, and uh, I think I think if you go, especially with family or friends uh, that have a love for the original movie, uh, that you're going to like it. Uh, and so uh, that's my recommendation on this. I think it's worth seeing. Uh, you can see it in the theater now. You can see it on, on digital or on disc later. Uh, but I think it's it, a good job was done. Uh, it's a shame that it, a slightly better job for me personally wasn't done on the musical numbers because I think for a movie like this, if it could just have ever so slightly better music, music that I really enjoy listening to, uh, like a Moana, uh, like a Frozen, uh, like some older stuff, uh, like a, like a Dream Girls, or, or even uh, Chicago, uh, which was also another Rob Marshall directed movie. I think that uh, it would be that much more enjoyable. So as it stands, it's a pretty simple plot. It's got good, but not great music. And it's got some good acting performances that mostly aren't asked to do a lot. Uh, so it's a pretty good Christmas movie, uh, and that's my recommendation. Um, so as the postmortem to that postmortem, uh, that's basically what I'm going to be looking to do here uh, on this channel. When you see a postmortem pop up, I'm going to hope to give uh, just really short thoughts uh, or, or concise thoughts on what I looked at in a film or in a video game or in a TV show or whatever it is I'm looking at. Um, not to be holistic. These aren't reviews. These aren't taking into account every little detail. They're just essentially the analogs to what uh, I would call saving it for the van and talking to uh, my wife or my daughters or my dad uh, about whatever it is we just saw or whatever it is we just experienced and really getting into how we felt about those things, the little bits and details that we liked, what we didn't like. Uh, and so please feel free to leave me a comment on whether this format works for you, whether you think it's a good idea or anything else that you'd like to see me cover in this fashion if I'm already going to see it. Uh, that would be great. Uh, in general, uh, don't expect a lot of negative reviews on this channel. I go into every movie or every video game really hoping to like it. And for the most part, I can almost always find something to enjoy uh, in whatever it is I'm experiencing. That's the way I like to live. Uh, so if I'm seeing something in the theater, if I'm playing something uh, on a video game console, or if I'm watching something on TV, chances are I turned that on. I went to that movie. I bought that video game because I thought it was going to be fun and there will be something fun in there. Uh, but 
So they're not holistic reviews. They are interesting thoughts uh, that I've had that I've discussed with uh, various people in, in my family or in my life. Uh, and I thought it would be an interesting idea to put these on uh, my YouTube channel to talk about them all with you. So please, if you've seen Mary Poppins Returns, uh, if you want me to cover anything differently, uh, send me a comment and uh, subscribe to this channel if you want to see more of this content because my hope is I can get some of these out uh, pretty quickly after I enjoy the, the content in question and can talk to you all about them. Thank you so much for watching.